the title ostriches and canaries forever thus god created us is is a take off from from gil valentine's book which i hold up here uh and uh, i highly recommend it uh, it's a it's a page turner because it takes up the um the pearson administration uh, the subtitle is 19 66 to 1979 coping with change in adventism and there's a lot here about what, what was going on when i was a seminary student at andrews university uh, and richard hamill was the president um, and then later richard hamill was a part of um, lauren you'd be interested in this when he retired he was at loma linda for at least part of the time, and came to the Sabbath school class, which is the precursor of your group here. And uh, I interviewed him because he was older, and that interview wasn't run until he died. He was living up in the Northwest at that time. And uh, Adventist Today published that interview uh, as a cover story. And, uh, and Incidentally, Gil Valentine references that interview because uh, it does show Richard Hamill as a much more candid person than he was when he was president at Andrews University, um, including isn't that, isn't that often to true, being... Jim? Isn't that often true? Um, for for many... People? I, I've tried myself to um, to um, to counter that um, that that uh, usual circumstance by being more or less unbridled um, throughout my career. But I, I think that is I, I think I think that is that is true. Um, OK, um, so here we go. Let me uh, let me go to my next slide here um i think we can here we go okay um so i am uh, i am not reviewing this book i'm using it as a takeoff for uh my own project and i uh that uh, want to be up front in saying that i'm using these two terms canaries and ostriches as uh, ideal types. Uh, th that's a sociological term. Uh, Max Weber, uh, H. Richard Niebuhr, his uh, Christ, uh, Christ and Culture uh, does that. Basically, where you it's where you're taking um, some terms that uh, are used as symbols for something larger than just those terms. And so that's what I'm. Uh, that's what I am doing here, and I am um, wanting to. Let me go to off of the gallery so that I can see all of my text here. Here we go. Okay, so, so here I am. Um, what did I just do there. Just a second. So, so I am uh, using the term canaries to uh, to represent the church progressives. Uh, most all of the people who are here at Sabbath seminars would be in that progressive camp, I would suggest. And the ostriches represent the fundamentalists. And, and th these are generalizations. Um, and I am wanting to argue that that because God is the creator of us all, that God, in a sense, metaphorically speaking, created both canaries and ostriches, and that Adventism uh, is, uh, in fact, sufficiently big, dynamic, and mature to not just abide, but even celebrate both. Am I saying that that is true of all Adventists or of most Adventists? No, uh, but it is uh, ideally the case. 
I, I suggest there are powerful reasons to get beyond the either or mentality. You know, either you are a good fundamentalist Adventist or you're not even an Adventist. Uh, there are both types of Adventists, the ostriches and the canaries, and it goes back to the denomination's founding, I would suggest. But deep in the denominational DNA, there is an opposing momentum to that larger view that I am advocating. That, that uh, traditional DNA treasures the exclusivity of either or. Nevertheless, the promise of Adventism is only realized when we acknowledge our penchant for this fundamentalist sort of either or thinking, and we, we progress to the more progressive both and sentiment. And uh, as I say here at the bottom, I argue that uh, informed by our history, the genius of Adventism and really religion itself is deeply affective. It, it's in our inner selves, uh, our emotions. And that deeply affective religion is largely regulated by reason, but it's not at its core so much founded in reason as it's founded in something more visceral and deep within us. The fundamentalist uh, progressive distinction roughly parallels these undergirding elements. And um, I am suggesting that, uh, let me see here. Uh, Lauren, tell me, I've got a band across the top which keeps me from being able to see the title of this, this slide. How do I get rid of that band? Uh, it has- uh, William Miller, you're at William Miller and James White Canaries. Uh, maybe, Terry maybe knows. I, I think I, if you go to the very, put your cursor at the very top of your screen and double click it. At the very top? Very top and double click. Uh, Okay. Did it change the way it appears for you? No, no, it didn't. Sorry, right. I don't have any other suggestions. Okay. If it okay. goes to full screen, it doesn't show the top right. Yeah, that, that that's uh, that's okay. I can, I I can I can make it out. Okay. Uh, Jim, if you have trouble, I can. Uh... I can request remote control and control your slides. Um, but if you. Okay. Um, no, I, I can, I, I can read, uh, I can read the, I can, I, I can, oh, here, I, I've got, I've got, I've, I've got uh, copies of all my slides here in front of me. So that's okay. Good. Good. Okay. Good. Uh, here we go. Okay, um, uh, William Miller um, and James White, I suggest um, using that ideal type are canaries. Uh, Miller, um, given this Valentine taxonomy, he leaned more canary than ostrich, you know, if, if you have to choose. Uh, so so I, I'm, I'm making larger points uh, about these, these categories so uh, I hope you appreciate the larger point I'm making and we can come back and discuss it. Um, I think that you see this canary sort of more intellectual um, characteristic of, of William Miller in that post the great disappointment, he had his Albany conference, 1846, not 1845, uh, in which he and key Millerite leaders regrouped, they acknowledged their prophetic miscalculation, and they opposed what they saw as a fanatical wing in their movement. And then in his present truth, James White, um, this was what, five years later after the Great Disappointment, um, he published numerous visions of his relatively new wife, Ellen. Uh, but he was sensitive to the criticism of fanaticism, something that 
Miller wanted to avoid, and he criticized the fanatics in his own movement. Uh, but James, um, he wanted to avoid that criticism of fanaticism and also that he was following another rule of faith in the scriptures. And so this calculating canary James, he published none, zero of his wife's now less frequent visions and his newly founded Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, which went, as you can see, from um, mid uh, 1850, not 1950, to uh, 1856. And his former publication, Present Truth, you can see it went for about 18 months. And he was publishing Ellen White's visions, uh, numerous visions. But then he, uh, he calculated that he ought not. And he did it because he said, as many are prejudiced against divisions, we think best at present not to insert anything of the kind in the regular paper. And, and we can come back and talk about these two papers and what was going on there, uh, but let me move on. So um, Ellen White uh, was an ostrich, but she was a, a very shrewd ostrich, I would suggest. Um, Miller opposed what he saw as a fanatical wing in his movement that included people like Ellen White. It's not coincidental that Ellen Harmon uh, portrayed in court documents as lying prostrate on the floor in Israel Damon's house was one of several visionaries that participated in that Millerite believers prayer meeting that took place in February, 1845. So what is that like four, five, four months after the, uh, the great disappointment. And within a year, she and James were married and, uh, and with Joseph Bates, they founded what would become the Seventh-day Adventist denomination of 22 plus million members, whereas Miller's Advent Christian denomination has only uh, 60,000 members worldwide, some say up to uh, 100,000, but relatively small. And part of my argument is that, that uh, because religion and Adventism is deeply affective without that affective engine, as it were, you don't have the sort of uh, compelling power that you have if you do have that uh, that uh, affective dimension as being central. Okay, uh, Israel Damon's uh, court case uh, was covered by a local newspaper. Um, a Loma Linda physician uh, uh, researcher uh, was able to, to uh, find that. And um, Doug Hackelman in his Adventist Currents back in uh, nine, 1988 um, published a, a, a very disclosive account of that trial. And in part, uh, Ellen White is quoted as saying that she told her vision to a cousin of mine that she must be baptized that night or go to hell. Another witness gave similar testimony about Ellen Harmon's warnings of hell, adding, we believed her. Okay, um, moving on. Um, uh, a very pivotal conference was held in 1855. The Adventist denomination was moving west uh, as the country was developing with uh, people moving to California and Oregon and Washington. But in 1855, there was a showdown over Ellen White's visions. Uh, James White uh, was accused of downplaying his wife's visions. And that was a, a focus at that conference of about 60 Adventists. Uh, a month earlier, uh, so that would have been October 1855, in the uh, Adventist Review, it was reported that there was a class of persons determined to make the 
views of Ellen White a test of doctrine and Christian fellowship. Uh, James White reported that. Uh, when <clears throat> what has has the review, James, uh, editor James White uh, asks, what has the review to do with Mrs. W's views? The sentiments published in its columns are all drawn from the Holy Scriptures. No writer of the review has ever referred to them as authority. The review for five years has not published one of them. But White's fellow believers, mostly men, uh, Millerite Adventists, uh, they were they resoundedly disagreed with editor White's perceived disregard. They contended that Ellen's visions were God's, you can see the quote at the bottom there, adopted means for the perfection of the saints in these last days. They vented their, quote, fear that we have grieved the spirit by neglecting the blessings already conferred upon the church. We re refer to the visions which God has promised to the remnant. Uh, and the um, the Adventist Church makes copies of these early early um, printed uh, editions of the Advent, the Review and the Review and Herald that makes them very available. You can check out any of this that uh, I'm I'm putting here for your own edification if you so choose. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Did I? I think I forgot to give you this slide. That's the one I was just reading from. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, James White is a, uh, a steadfast canary. Uh, uh, two months after the Battle Creek Conference, the newly appointed review editor Uriah Smith published a direct criticism of James White with White's candid response. So uh, Lauren, uh, unlike the current uh, Adventist review, the one at the beginning was very open about uh, uh, controversy in the church. Um, so, so, so get this, this is from, um, what, uh, the review in 1840, 1846, a brother Bingham, uh, speaking for Vermont Adventists, said White had placed a less estimate on Ellen White's gift than the churches here have. Uh, Bingham called for some apology through the review that shall be relief to many minds. But James uh, stood by his uh, five-year review editorial leadership. Uh, the Bible is my rule and my, my rule of faith and practice. And in saying this, I do not reject the Holy Spirit in its diversities of operations. Uh, I suggest using my typology that that James the canary is using his both and approach. You know, he, he could get beyond just the visceral need to believe in his wife's spiritual gifts to be able to see the need for both sides. And he called, he recalled that it was, quote, well known that we Adventists have been charged with testing all men by the visions and making them the rule of our faith. And White concluded, this I have denied and deny it still. So um, th this canary ostrich dynamic, uh, mm -hmm. it's very early and it's very deep in our DNA, I suggest. Uh, James White uh, believed he could be both respectable in the eyes of the larger public and fully accepting of Ellen's gift of, gift of prophecy. And he could do that as a person. Uh, but he could not do that editorially. And so there was this uh, uprising at by those 60 Adventists, some of them were, were 
were moneyed Adventists because they put up enough money to put up the, the new publishing house in Battle Creek. Uh, the, four of them uh, gave, uh, gave $3,000 a piece. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and some, so we have the names of a number of them, but uh, from reading the material, I estimate that there were about 60 and they, uh, they, they didn't, um, they didn't fire James White, but he resigned. But, but uh, when you read between the lines, you see that he resigned uh, because of the pressure that he was feeling. The, the powerful religio-emotional forces at the Sabbatarian, <clears throat> of the Sabbatarian Adventists were too strong. Ellen willingly complied with, with her devotees' needs. James stepped into place as the new editor, Uriah Smith, resumed vision, visionary article publication. And Smith and White would seesaw being the review editor four times over the next 20 years. And then James had an early uh, untimely death. Uh, in 1855, uh, eight years before formal organization, you, you know, um, Adventists didn't want to organize because they felt they would become Babylon the time that they organized, at least many of them did. Um, but uh, in 1855, this fledgling, in un, unorganized Adventism dramatically demonstrated these contrasting styles of dealing with common faith issues. And I think that we see that that contrast uh, continues. Okay, let's uh, look at these two uh, individuals who uh, continued this populist Millerite mentality that um, essentially deposed James White as editor of the review in 1855 and put in Uriah, uh, put in Uriah Smith. Um, the popular discontent that replaced James with Smith continued on to gain ascendancy in the church. And uh, I uh, suggest that we see this primarily through these two leaders, Claude Holmes and J.S. Washburn. Um, <clears throat> Judson Washburn proudly continued what he saw as the strain of Adventism, which was faithful. It's old time Adventism. Uh, it sees uh, ultra traditionalist Uriah Smith he saw him as his idol. And he followed his uncle, G.I. Butler, in opposing righteousness by faith. You may recall G.I. Butler was the GC president in 1888 who spoke against uh, Jones and Wagner preaching righteousness by faith at that pivotal general conference session. Ellen White sided with Jones and Wagner they did preach, but uh, that shows that tension that existed between the old time Adventism and the more progressive Adventism with Butler on one side and Ellen White on the other in 1888. Washburn, he is coming from this solid Adventist pioneer stock. Uh, and he was a very bright guy, reportedly memorized the New Testament. And this split between progressives and uh, and the traditionalist, the fundamentalist, I suggest doesn't have any direct relationship to, uh, mm -hmm. to, to native intelligence. It has to do more with uh, world views that one comes to similar data with. Uh, it, it has to do with world views that are deep within us. Okay, um, later in a mass circulated pamphlet, um, uh, Washburn, he criticized the 1919 Bible Conference's candid discussion of Ellen White 
he saw it as the most terrible thing that had ever happened in Adventist history. And the GC president, A.G. Daniels, who called for that conference and orchestrated it, he said that Washburn's claims were the worst tirade ever put in print by an Adventist minister. Okay. Okay, let me go to um, to Claude Holmes. He was 18 years Washburn's junior and he raised the decibel level even higher in beating Ellen White's inerrancy drum. Uh, he was a perfectionist linotype operator. Uh, you, you could uh, go online and go to the Adventist online encyclopedia and you find a fine uh, description of Claude Holmes. Um, he accepted nothing less than a letter perfect prophet uh, publishing in his little pamphlet, uh, have we an infallible spirit of prophecy? Question mark. This was two years before Daniels was denied the GC president in 1922. And in that pamphlet, uh, he asserts, one tells me her books are not in harmony with facts historically. Another that she is scientific is wrong scientifically. Another, still another, disputes her claims theologically, and another questions her authorship. And another discredits her writings grammatically and rhetorically. Is there anything left? The sarcastic Holmes asks. Uh, Continuing to quote, several have said to me, oh, you are making a pope out of Mrs. White. I reply, never. I would not lower the dignity and authority of God's messenger by putting her on a par with a pope. She is far above and superior to any pope. Isn't that a classic quote? <laughs> okay, let's uh, move on. Uh, uh, two very different individuals representing a different strain of Adventism, which is, as I'm saying, is less characteristic of the Ellen White, Millerite, popular, um, affectively um, centered uh, strain of Adventism, were Prescott and Daniels. They're part of the minority uh, in the church back then and the minority that continues today. Uh, w. W. Prescott, he did come from a Millerite family, but he was a but he was a second generation church leader in Adventism and went on to serve the GC on the GC executive committee for no less than 42 years. Um, and overall, he served the denomination for 52 years, um, largely in publishing and in education. But notice his background. Uh, he earned his, his bachelor's degree and also a master's degree from Dartmouth. And he, a very talented man, uh, was later president of the Battle Creek College. And uh, it, it almost seems miraculous that this talented guy could while being at Battle Creek, co-found both Walla Walla College and Union College. And subsequently uh, with Lacey, H.C. Lacey and A.G. Daniels, he helped Ellen White found Avondale College in Australia. And he later aided Ellen White in her editing her new uh, edition of The Great Controversy, uh, he suggested no less than over a hundred changes, and most of them uh, were accepted for that uh, 1911 edition of the Great Controversy. Okay, moving on. Uh, A.G. Daniels, I suggest, is a, uh, a pragmatic uh, canary. Um, Daniels was a very valued colleague of Ellen White. Um, he was not only an able administrator uh, serving as the GC president longer than any other person from 1901 to 1923, 
but he was also a bold thinker who long sensed the need for the denomination to view Ellen White's divine inspiration more realistically than people like Holmes and Washburn. And hence he called for this 1919 Bible conference. This was what, four years after Ellen White's death, uh, 1915. Uh, he knew of these exaggerated claims that were being made about her. And so he, he gathered a leading churchman uh, and I think I, I say churchmen advisedly. I I don't know of any women who were there. Some of you who have read the 1919 Bible Conference materials better than I might correct me, but but they they were his people. Uh, uh, Holmes and Washburn were not there. Uh, the conference uh, was to become a lightning rod attracting the fiery criticism of Washburn and Holmes and factoring into his Daniels GC presidential ouster. Ouster may not be the right word. He decided to not, uh, to, to not uh, contend to be the uh, incoming, well, the continuing GC president, because he saw all of the opposition that he was, he was, um, he was facing. Daniels courageously convened this 19 conference, despite awareness of a widespread inerrancy sentiment among both church laity and pastors. Even many of the Washington Missionary College board members were ultra conservative, observes Valentine in his book that I just referenced. This sentiment was evidently widespread even among leading laypersons. Um, <clears throat> let me um, cite uh, Benja the late Benjamin MacArthur, who has written the most definitive biography to date on A.G. Daniels. And he faults Daniels for failing to fight for an enlightened view of Ellen White's inspiration. However, I suggest that this, if, if he had fought for this more enlightened view, it would have meant taking on the Washburn Holmes majority. And MacArthur sees Daniels in action here, not taking them on as his most significant failure. And, and here I quote from, um, from MacArthur's, um, uh, his thumbnail sketch of, of, Mac, uh, of Daniels. And this is taken from the, um, from the Adventist Encyclopedia uh, entry that's online. And I should state here that I'm not giving you footnotes, but what I'm giving you is taken uh, is published in full form in the latest spectrum, and there is full full footnotes and larger text than what I'm giving you here. So that's where you can uh, see a more scholarly. Uh, edition of this material that I'm giving you. Okay, so um, here is this quote from this encyclopedia entry by uh, MacArthur. For all of Daniel's brave talk about Ellen White's inspiration during the 1919 Bible conference sessions, uh, according to MacArthur, he, Daniels, faltered. The transcripts were filed away, not to be rediscovered for decades. This was perhaps Daniel's greatest failure as leader. Rather than leading his church toward a much needed reexamination of their prophet's writings, he allowed the church during the 1920s to turn down the path of fundamentalism. And then Here's a paragraph of, of my take on this, and it is my take, and uh, 
uh, I'll be interested to hear uh, some of you informed people um, um, argue with me because I, I don't know that I'm right, but uh, I, I can at least uh, give more reasons for what I'm saying here than what I give you. Uh, I suggest that MacArthur's judgment is understandable, but I think that it fails to consider the fundamentalist sentiment that's characterized most Adventist believers from the beginning. In Daniel's decision to file the conference transcriptions, he likely sensed, at least intuitively, that denominational unity was at stake. At the 1919 conference, he gathered top church leadership. And as the GC president, for the past 18 years, you know, when he started that conference, he had disproportionate say about who those leaders would be uh, who would lead this church of then less than 70,000 members. And I'm here in Southern California and what the Southeastern California Conference, I think, which has, you know, Loma Linda and La Sierra and, and, and San Diego does not have Los Angeles. But that conference, what, what does it have? Like 120,000 members, something like that. But a lot more in Southeastern California conference than were in the whole worldwide church at that time. So we weren't a large group then. Okay, given the composition of Daniel's top colleagues in 1919, his progressive views easily prevailed. And those 1919 Bible conference uh, transcripts, uh, when I read those, having just completed my doctorate at Claremont in 1979, I was just blown away at the candor of, of what was being discussed there. But, but Daniels didn't want that candid discussion to get out for reasons I'm indicating and he basically said, hey, let's uh, let's put those things, um, you know, in the vault. And, and they stayed there until uh, Don Yost uh, discovered them wrapped up uh, in the archives of the General Conference in, um, in what, in the late 70s. Um, it was, it was, it's, it's quite a, uh, quite a story. Okay, uh, I suggest that um, that this was a showdown that Daniels, as a churchman, uh, saw would happen in the general church over White's inspiration, Ellen White's inspiration, and it was a battle that he 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 sensed that he would lose, and uh, he he he. Um, he avoided it. Okay, coming to toward the end. Um, I suggest that his shelving of the 1919 transcripts um, was, uh, this is subject to interpretation, whether it's a leadership failure or wise leadership. Uh, Daniel's crucial 1919 shelving decision may have been less a leadership failure than a perceptive leader's reading of the denomination's zeitgeist or undergirding nature. Regardless, hindsight suggests that despite popular Adventism's inerrantist views, Daniel's should have shared, I suggest, key insights from those 1919 transcripts and thus deliberately kept alive the important deliberation over Ellen White's prophetic role. But, but he didn't. As important as the Daniels-Washburn standoff was, it is secondary to the deeper value of sustaining Adventism as a thriving Adventist frontier church that would grow to the size that it is today. Um, there is, um, there's an interesting book. Some of you may have read this, uh, it's George Knight's Ellen White's Afterlife. Um, 
this was published by Pacific Press about four years ago. Yeah, in 19, it's in 2019, I believe it is. But he, in this book, uh, shows the sort of Adventism that he was uh, taught and that held up until the 19, um, the 19, 60s, late 1960s, early 1970s, where we had what Spectrum Magazine came out with and published, uh, what Ron Numbers did, um, and other historians, which have shown us a different type of Ellen White, uh, one which was basically unknown to people like George Knight, unknown to people like me, until we read those 1919 transcripts. Okay, let me um, give you one more slide and then we'll open it up uh, for discussion. Uh, as a lifelong Adventist um, pastor professor, only more recent study has led to a deeper, more inclusive view of religion uh, and my own Adventism. Uh, I'm now more interested in being accepting than in changing my fellow and sister believers. And let me hold up another book. Uh, this one doesn't have a fancy title cover, but it's Oxford University Press put this out about five years ago. It's called um, Why We Need Religion. Where is that? Um, why We Need Religion is the, um, is the name of it. And basically what this Chicago professor who is, I don't think he confesses to being Christian, he's more influenced by Eastern religion, but why we need religion is because it affects us at the deeper levels of our being. Uh, it, he says it has its intellectual problems and challenges, but that is uh, putting religion uh, uh, before the wrong bar when it comes to what it's about. Religion isn't to give us the final intellectual answers. It's to give us a reason for being. And that's why we need religion uh, in his view. And and I have been influenced by that. And I see Adventism as having its intellectual challenges, but because it addresses not only fundamentalist person's inner needs, but the inner needs of people like you and me, that, that we need it. Um, <clears throat> And so I am suggesting uh, that this Adventism that I am calling for, which has both and, not just either or mentality, that this is the sort of rebooted Adventism 2.0 that can celebrate both its fundamentalist and its progressives. And, and it's important to understand these two key points, the, the undergirding dynamic of religion in general, and second, the unique Adventist claim to present truth. So let me just conclude here by saying that, uh, as I was mentioning, religion in general is more a matter of heart than it is head. And this is especially true of Millerite Adventism. Um, and just a word about that notion of present truth. I think that historically this was tied to the Sabbath, but uh, there's a deeper meaning to it than what the originators imagined. And that deeper meaning has to do with the notion that truth needs to be present to us in our own lived circumstances and not just relegated to something that was present truth in the past, 
but one of the problems is that the fundamentalist Adventism, they don't get this deeper meaning, this deep, deeper dynamism of Adventism. They tie it to what was going on 180 years ago, and they don't allow it to be more progressive. So, so that tension is with Adventism, and rather than letting Ted Wilson and company define Adventism for me, I want to identify with this bold pursuit of truth that characterized our pioneers, and I suggest must continue to characterize a segment of the church today. So um, I think I went over my time, um, but thank you for letting me put this before you. I think you're just about right on time. And I just want to thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, I always thought about William Miller and his idea of just getting a Bible and getting a concordance and starting at Genesis 1-1 and going through the Bible and trying to figure out what it said. And I wonder if any Adventists would feel permitted to do that or if they have this baggage of you know, what does the church say? What does the denominational record say? What did the vision say? Would they feel the same permission that William Miller felt? Um, I, I, I don't think, um, what, what I think it depends, Gina, on whether you're talking about the um, the fundamentalist Adventist or the progressive Adventist. Um, the, the fundamentalist Adventist is going to say, what, if, if, if Ellen White didn't give you permission to take that approach, or if Ted Wilson doesn't give you that permission, you don't have it. Whereas the more open approach, the more progressive approach would, um, would, I think be more open to letting individuals have the freedom to take that approach if that's how they felt uh, they needed to in putting their religion together uh, in a coherent way. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to Leland. I'm going to take a shot at your last name. Is it Yelilani? Yelilanis? Yalalis. Say it again. Yalalis. Yalalis, I'm going to ask you if you can share your comments with us. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm curious how you would understand Acts 15. It seems to me that in Acts 15, we have two groups. We've got ostriches and canaries. And it seems to me that the Holy Spirit led the group in Acts 15 to make a very distinct uh, move in the direction of the canaries. How do you understand that? Okay. Uh, okay. Acts 15 um, is where the leaders of the early church had gathered to decide about um, Paul and the Gentiles. Isn't that right? Well, it, they there was this, this crisis over how much of Judaism was going to be carried into Christianity, circumcision, the right. etc. And it was beginning to be a divisive issue within Christianity as more and more Gentiles joined that didn't have the attachment to the, the old uh, Jewish traditions. Right. Right. And uh, yeah. And um and 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 you're you're thinking that the the decision of the church leaders in Acts 15 was more canary like than ostrich like. Um, yeah, I um, uh, let, let me let me just think about that. I uh, I um, I I think that. Yeah, 
I think that that's I, I think that's right. Uh, but I mean, Ellen White herself, she was, I, I'm, you know, this tax, let, let's not get hung up on that taxonomy. The, um, the, I mean, Ellen White herself, I'm suggesting was more ostrich than canary like. Uh, but she so, shows progress in her thought. Uh, the Ellen White who was on rolling on the floor of Israel Damon's house in 1845 was not the Ellen White who died in 1915 uh, and who, who, who saw Marion Davis as her bookmaker and allowed great freedom in putting together books like um, Steps to Christ and Desire of Ages. Um, uh, Ellen, Ellen White showed um, real uh, differences from her early days until her last days. And I think that's sort of a premise that John Butler is working with in a, in a manuscript, a book manuscript that he's uh, sometimes working on, on more than others. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I would, I would say that yeah, in, in those early days uh, that um, the decision to clearly get beyond requiring uh, certain Jewish practices was more ost more canary-like than ostrich-like, yes. It, Leland, it, I think you raised a really interesting question. I'm sorry? I think you've raised a very interesting question. Yeah, it, it thank you. Uh, it seems to me that there are times if we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit that we're forced to make a decision between canaries and ostriches. Yes, no. I'm thinking about Galatians. I think they were talking about it in Galatians also. Yeah, uh, Jim, I, it, if you, Jim, could you unshare your screen right now? And so we can. Uh, um, yeah. 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 I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm wanting to do that. Um, okay. Go ahead, Leland. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, it's okay. I I I, I understand the, the the dynamic of a of an institution like Adventism that is trying to hold itself yes. together. Uh, I, but at the same time, it seems to me that we as Christians occasionally face choices whether we're going to be a true to New Testament truth, in particular New Testament truth. And sometimes that isn't always convenient. I mean, what would have happened if Luther had stayed a Catholic? Good points to ponder. Yeah, but, but but things are a bit more complex than that, I would suggest. You, you know, what is Bible truth, even New Testament truth? Um, it's, um, it, it's not, those are not easy questions to answer. Uh, and, and that's because we as individuals and as uh, different, communities come to these questions of what is biblical truth, what is Adventist truth with a whole um, with a whole mindset that is important. Um, I, I, I was reminded of that when I read um, this piece that um, Adventist Today just uh, published about dancing, uh, Lauren, uh, and I I looked up that um, reference that was made to Augustine saying that one should uh, rather plow than dance. And, and that comes from St. Augustine. What is this? You know, this is uh, uh, what, uh, 17, 1800 years ago? Um, he, he brought his own person to the Psalms, and, and that's where he had that reference. And here's 
Here is his exposition on Psalm 92. And the reason I'm wanting to bring this up is to say, St. Augustine had expectations of what life was about as a person who was writing in the, what, fourth century? Uh, he brought that baggage. We each bring our own baggage. So here's, here's how he starts off his commentary on Psalm 92. We are not Christians except on account of a future life. Let no one hope for present blessings let no one promise himself the happiness of the world because he is a Christian. I, I mean, and I'm not faulting uh, St. Augustine for bringing that view of the, a dismal view of present life to his, uh, to his exposition of the Psalms. I'm just saying all of us bring our own selves to the text. And that's why I can be more sympathetic to the Adventist pioneers, Ellen White, for instance, uh, and, and the Millerites in general, be they the more intellectual Millerites or the more uh, emotional Millerites like Ellen was. You, you know, we're all the products of, of, of a, certain, um, uh, a certain setting, certain influences, and we should be more accepting of one another because my basic argument, God created both ostriches and canaries. Thank, Thank you very you. much for allowing me to, I see other hands up. I'm curious what other people are, th are thinking. Lauren, why don't you join us and let us know I, what you're thinking? Uh, sure, glad to. Uh, Lee put me in mind of, of something that I've noticed uh, in the last Oh, five years or so, uh, Lee, starting about that time that uh, they started talking about compliance committees because some of the unions weren't, were, were going ahead and, and uh, ordaining women anyway. Uh, Mark Finley started preaching sermons about Acts 15. I don't know how many sermons in Acts 15 he would he would preach at GC meetings and executive committee and all of them <laughs> wrong. I mean, ba basically, <clears throat> basically the general conference took the stance that acts 15, the consultation with the brethren in Jerusalem was the general conference and everybody, they, they went and asked and they got an answer and they all followed it. Well, exactly, not exactly true. You know, if you, if you actually read Paul in Romans 14, he he didn't uh, hold with the notion that the the uh, idols, if food was offered to idols, really meant anything. He said only don't eat it only if if uh, some weak brother is going to be offended by it. But he says the idols are nothing anyway. I mean, basically, Paul ignores the Jerusalem Council, so that this constant drumbeat that Mark Finley was going on that the Acts 15 was the general conference and everybody believed it and everybody followed them. It's just nonsense. Anyway, uh, I, I have I have another thing I want to uh, <clears throat> pursue with you, Jim. I remember when I was a young pastor, I asked a friend of mine, uh, who was an older pastor, I said, uh, Steve, I'm looking forward to the day when uh, people like you and me have made it into running the church and the church becomes more open-minded and progressive. And he said to me, but Lauren, what, is that, what if that doesn't happen that way? What if it goes exactly the other way? At that point in time, I had no sense that that was even a possibility i it just seemed to be so clear that we were moving in the progressive direction a more open church a broader church a church that accepted more people that didn't major in in picky little minor things well steve was right and i was wrong and I guess I have to say, Jim, that my experience, my observation over my years as a pastor 
<clears throat> is that, uh, yes, there are some canaries. They pop up here and there. And by here and there, I actually mean in certain communities, uh, in certain geographic communities, but also in certain uh, professions and certain kinds of people who are willing to be progressive. But for the most part, I, I, I hope I'm wrong, but for the most part, I've seen that throughout my life and uh, preceding that time, the... Uh, the, the fundamentalists were on the offensive and gaining ground. And the uh, progressives were always on the defensive. They would pop out here and there with, with some good stuff. We had Spectrum magazine, which was very important to me when I was a, when I was a, a young pastor. But I never, never felt those things reflected in churches in the areas where I pastored. I knew I knew it. Th thoughts like that were being thunk uh, in Southern California. Praise the Lord for that. Besides that, I didn't know a church like that, and um, I still think it hasn't changed that much. You know, I, I did most of my ministry out in uh, what you guys call the flyover country. And uh, <clears throat> out here, I have found that most Adventists will always, even, even if you can get them to agree that, yes, grace is great, and Jesus loves everybody, and, and we're saved by grace, they'll very, very quickly revert to a fundamentalist point of view if somebody comes along and gives it to them. You can, uh, you can even get a church here and there to allow a, a, a gay person to come in and be part of the church family, not, not a, an officer, but part of the church family. But it only awaits some new person to step in and say, this is a sin, and they'll quickly revert back to the fund. We, we, the, it's almost like we're spring-loaded. We, we go back to that fundamentalist position very easily. And... Uh, I guess that's my observation, Jim. Uh, it, it, you know, let's let's be honest. Fulcrum Seven probably makes more uh, gets uh, contributions more easily than Adventist today does, because they're always taking that fundamentalist view. I hate to think that about my church, but I think it's true. Well, uh, uh, thank you for your candor, um, Lauren. Um, I, I suggest that 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 you, by framing your comments as you do, have already yielded to the fundamentalist branding of Adventism. And 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 I say, don't do it. Uh, quote James White. Remember that line I gave you from James White after, after he when he was defending why he um, was not publishing his wife's visions. Um, you know, he he says this, this is what I I have done and I will continue to do it. What did he say? Um, uh, uh, anyway, I, I I could find it where where he he said that I, I have uh, not as many are prejudiced against visions. Wrote uh, James, we think best at present not to insert anything of the kind in the regular paper. And and then he was pushed on that, and he he doubled down and reaffirmed what he had said. Uh, so so I say let's identify with that sentiment from early Adventism and not let the Holmes and the Washburns and the Wilsons take that, uh, that bold Adventism away from us. It, you know, so, so, you know, when it comes to numbers, you're right. But the, the, uh, the seeds of uh, the undoing of uniform fundamentalist Adventism were sown when we started 
to emphasize education. Look at all of the, that Ellen White has written about education. Look at right. all that she has written about health. And uh, as John Pauline, who came from Andrews to Loma Linda, where he was our dean for uh, you know 12 years or so, he said, Andrews is where the church is looking at itself. Loma Linda is where the church is looking at the world. And, um, and you know, look at, uh, look at the uh, millions of encounters with patients through Adventist healthcare institutions around the world, which keeps us in touch with the real society rather than just talking to ourselves. And these are harbingers of, um, of hope for Adventism to continue to be to be our, from your and my point of view, our best selves, where we combine the affective and the intellect. Uh, but when it comes to numbers, yeah, you've got numbers on your side, but we've been, uh, as ordained pastors in the Adventist church, Lauren, we've been too enamored with numbers for too long. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. I, I would argue that I have not surrendered to the fundamentalists because I'm the editor of Adventist today and and uh, start this started the Sabbath school class with you and uh, we're, we we do take the opposing point of view. I'm just saying that in my experience, the church defaults there very easily. Well, I, I think I, that's I agree with you, but I would just want to um, differ with you on the church. The church is you and me too. Well, that's uh, that that's a, a point of view that uh, our mutual friend uh, Fritz Guy used to say. Um, rest in peace. Uh, he used to say, "Lauren, nobody gets to tell me I'm what I'm an Adventist or not." It's up to me to decide whether I'm an Adventist. Well, okay, I, I appreciate that, and I told him so. Uh, but in the end, a lot of pro probably more people would say that I'm not an Adventist than would say that I am one. Uh, even though I've, you and I have stuck with this to to the bitter end here. Anyway, I, <laughs> yeah, come that's on, enough. Come on. We're we're staying with it to the glorious end. Um, ah, okay. And it's it's not the end. We're we're the uh, we're we're part of the uh, of the mat the maturing remnant. Um, <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd like to hear what I'd like to hear what Carolyn Jarnes has to say. Carolyn, hi. Um, this is brought up. I have not really ever read things from James White and weren't he and Ellen kind of separated at the time of his death and was this over his non-support of her visions oh you mean I am not a historian but uh, I, I do know enough to uh, know that two or three of the things you've just alluded to are not true. Um, okay. uh, that they weren't separated at his death, as I understand it. And, and I've gotten into some of this material the last couple of years because I've uh, I have an in, increased um, existential interest in these things because. Um, be it good and bad, and it is good and bad, um, from my point of view, our Adventist upbringing has made an indelible impression on those of us who've grown up Adventist. Uh, and so I'm interested in unpacking these things. And but I so I've been hanging out with Adventist historians more than usual lately. And uh, I did find out recently that Ellen and White, Ellen and James White did have their differences. And they did live apart um, for several months, I think six or eight months um, at, at one point. Um, 
but they um, they weren't separated at you know they didn't they never had any sort of permanent separation and uh, they were and, and and he James White um, accepted his wife as a visionary as a prophetic visionary um he 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 believed in her visions but he did not believe in them in the way that the inerrantists like holmes and washburn believed in them so so it, it's it's more nuanced i mean james was there in israel damon's house in in 1845 cradling ellen harman in his lap when uh, the police came and raided that house for a disturbance of the peace. Um, so it's not like James and Ellen were totally different. It's just that James was more cerebral than she was, and he could make judgments about the fledgling denomination that he and Ellen were helping to form that she couldn't make and that Uriah Smith couldn't make and that most Millerite Adventists couldn't make, but he could because he he leaned canary, whereas she leaned ostrich. Is that helpful at all? Yeah, it is. I just uh, wondered if his concerns and leaning um, canary, I guess, caused a rift, so to speak, in their relationship. Oh, oh, I, I it think does, it did. I think it did. You know, I think the they church. were, you know, they had distinctive personalities, but they they complemented one another rather than, I mean, you know, yeah, friction. Yeah, there was, you know, yeah, there was friction. That the um, I mean, Ellen White was a very complex individual who, who had, and it's not, and, and the traits that were talked about by this group of about twenty historians that I met with at PUC back on the weekend of October twenty-two, it was not all complimentary. I mean, Gil Valentine gave a talk about Ellen White's. Um, personality and <laughs> she, she, she she was not an easy person to get along with i'm going to go to ray morris can you join us ray and unmute yeah sure um thanks for your um very comprehensive uh, presentation having read uh, gail valentine's book uh you filled in a lot of the time prior to what he covered. But my concern is you, you mentioned in your last slide the possibility of Adventism 2.0. I see that with the current um, leadership of the church, which is very much in the ostrich mindset. I can never see that happening within the denomination. Um, yes, there are people who are... Um, very outspoken and um, address the other point of view. And I greatly appreciate um, Adventist Today and the articles and the honesty that they put out. But I can never see things changing because it, it's almost as though the current leadership has got a complete lockdown on situations. And unfortunately, a lot of um, a lot of parts of the world are completely unaware of this uh, battle between uh, progressive uh, looking Adventism and um, uh, the fundamentalists. Um, I'm in the UK and I would say it's it's ver it's only individuals that are even aware of um, any sort of conflict whatsoever. As um, Lawrence said, um, if you get somebody who pick, pokes their head above the parapet with a, a different viewpoint, somebody will come along and everybody will step back in line. So Whilst I think um, it's very interesting to look back, I think we as a church need to say what is going to happen looking forward, because I can't see 
unless there's a fundamental change in the um, hierarchy at the general conference, I can never see them um, being prepared to allow um, different disciplines and different viewpoints exist within the corporate church. I'm sorry. There yeah, it is. I, 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 think, I think you're right, Ray, uh, when it comes to the current leadership. But I point you to um, the previous GC president, Jan Paulson, yeah. uh, who was, was very different from the current GC president. And, and given the hierarchical thinking in Adventism, um, if, if you did have a GC president, if you had Ted Wilson, who was in favor of women's ordination, I could see him saying at a general conference session to the World Church, uh, folk, it's time for us to recognize that different views about the status of women are held in uh, across the denomination. And we on a division by division um, choice need to allow different regions of the church to go forward on this as they so debate and choose. And and that because look at the church in uh, in in uh, in Africa it you know it's tribal the, the, its yeah. roots are tribal in South America its roots are hierarchical because of the Catholic influence in Asia where you have what about fifteen or twenty percent of Adventists uh, their tradition is caste system all of it very hierarchical. And it's just in the UK and Europe, the United States, uh, New Zealand, Australia, that we have this uh, valuing of individual rights. Uh, and But we're like 6% going to yeah, soon to be yeah. 5% of the denomination. And so if the, if the, the head guy, and it will be a guy, says it's time to allow different regions to go their own way, it could happen overnight. Yeah, I, I accept your point uh, on that because um, I'm in the trans-European division and we've got a very, uh, I would say, enlightened leadership um, uh, in the in the trans-European division. But um, all the indications are that even if Ted Wilson doesn't stand uh, again at the next GC session, his uh, protege is of the same mindset as he is. So um, that's why I said I, I can't easily see things changing within my lifetime. Well, well, Ray, I don't think things are going to change, you know, and this gets back to the dispute I had with Lauren, you know, thinking, thinking holistic, uh, thinking categorical. The, I do not, I net, because of the DNA of Adventism, and it being rooted in uh, the affect, and the the affect is um, is is such that uh, we're always going to be quite hierarchical. I think as a denomination overall. But but let's but what I have convinced myself of is the value of not thinking totalistically but identifying with congregations and with Adventist institutions that represent what I see as the best of Adventism, not the, from my point of view, the worst of Adventism mm -hmm. and, uh, and appreciating that, you know, and I could point to how Dick Hart, the president of Loma Linda University has said some very positive things about the LGBTQ community and, and he and Ted Wilson have a, agreed to disagree on that because they're diametrically opposed. So there are institutions and individuals in Adventism that can chart something different from where the vast majority of Adventists are. Where I live, I'm also involved with um, 
uh, uh, groups in non-Adventist uh, congregations, uh, particularly the Anglican Church, where I live, which is in a small village. And they're facing all sorts of um, uh, progressive fundamentalist issues on ess essentially the LGBT issue. But as somebody um, said in a recent um, uh, YouTube video I watched, he said, these are side issues we should be concentrating on introducing people to Jesus Christ. That's where we should be focusing, not some of these peripheral issues, side issues, which actually draw us away from what we as Christian believers um, think is important. I just want to say, preach it, Ray Morris. <laughs> I'm with you on that. I want to go to Ray Stovall. What do you have for us today, Ray? History repeats itself, correct? Wandering in the wilderness of 40 years, progressives versus fundamentals. I see parallels to what we have happening today. It's been suggested that you need both, and perhaps it's because of the fundamentalism that we've expanded. I'd say I have difficulty believing that. You never progress. If the progressive been in charge, how big could it have been? How much closer to the end times could it have been? But fundamentalism holds things back. It's satisfied with status quo is the way I understand it. So a mixture we may have, but it is led by status quo. And isn't that what uh, dear old Moses had to put up with? Do we want to stay like Moses and those ancient Israelites? Or time for a new leader? You can't just go by small churches or large churches or certain institutions here and there say, well, they're progressive. They've been progressive for quite some time, but do they lead the church organization or does the GC? That, I, I don't know. I see too many ambiguities here. That's like, who's really in charge? That's all I got to say. Thank you, Ray. I'm going to well, go to Emmanuel and ask you to unmute. Good afternoon, where you, everyone. Where are you calling? Uh, where are you checking into us from here, Emmanuel? I, I am from New York City. From New York City. Okay. Um, I see a fundamental problem here, and I don't want to be pessimistic, but I don't see anytime soon a solution. If we look at the sermon of uh, the president of GC lately, uh. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 say, Come, let's reason together, says the Lord. The president of GC say, If you don't like it, leave. So, how can we reason together? If you say, Get out of here, how can we solve our differences when you say, Get out? I don't know how it's possible. I think that's a very interesting point. And before Jim tackles it, I'm going to throw in two cents with the LGBT community. And I know that there were some policies drafted within the last five or 10 years about homosexual people, as they call them, or transgenderism, as they call it. And I'm just wondering how many people from the church who fit into those categories were actually stakeholders and brought to the table to hear their voice and their point of view before these decisions were made. So and as far as coming and reasoning together, I think that's a very valid question. Uh, yeah. Um, I, what what um, Gentlemen in in New York from New York, I I would say 
the idea of coming and reasoning together as equals is not the mentality of the current leadership of the Adventist church. But uh, like I've been saying uh, repeatedly here is why let, um, let, let uh, a particular person heading up the hierarchy determine who is in the Adventist church. Um, I, I pointed to James White, who, who uh, defended his reasoning and not publishing his wife's visions. Uh, he gave a reasoned answer that wasn't accepted by the Millerite Adventist, and they saw that he didn't continue as editor. I mean, so th there's been that healthy tension all along. Uh, to get back to the earlier comment that I think Ray was making about the, um, <clears throat> we need the, the canaries to be in charge, not the ostriches. I, I don't agree with that. I mean, I'm a canary and the sort of Adventism that I have is not the sort that is going to uh, address the heart needs of of the vast majority of human beings, to say nothing of the vast majority of Adventists. That doesn't meet the needs of my wife of uh, 53 years. Uh, we're different people. She's much more affective than I am. Uh, and, and like I was saying earlier, the, uh, the more cerebral Millerites have a denomination that's less than 100,000 people. Uh, cerebral Adventism doesn't cut it with most human beings. Uh, affective Adventism does. So my plea in, in, in saying God created us both is to recognize the value of cerebral and the value of affective Adventism and, and let's, uh, let's get along better than we do at this point. Did you have any follow-up, Emmanuel? Um, no, no. It's okay. Thank okay. you. I'm going to go to Ed uh, and ask him to unmute. Good afternoon. Uh, Jim, I noted carefully your suggestion on your final page that we celebrate both uh, conservatives and progressives or fundamentalists and progressives. That's a beautiful ideal. Um, but it's really contradicted, at least historically, by another of your later statements, which talked about the fact that uh, a good solution to the women's ordination thing would be allow decisions to de divisions to decide and uh, that wasn't acceptable to leadership and apparently enough people to vote on it. Uh, so there are contradictions in reality. And um, so if it's unlikely that that would happen, where do we go? Uh, let's look at geopolitics for a minute. Uh, we're what, three or four in the North American division, we're three or four percent of the world church membership. Um, add in Europe, maybe Australia, and what do you get up to? Eight or ten percent. Uh, and uh, these are the regions that are most interested in the subject of women in ministry. So we got an issue where less than 10% of the church wants one thing and 90% of the church wants something else. It's likely, not impossible, but it's likely we've seen the last American GC president. And that has implications for the future. Because let's face it, we're out of step with the 90% in many ways. 
the 90 percent is collectively more fundamentalist than we are collectively. So it's always going to be difficult for the 10 percent to say to the 90 percent, hey, let's all celebrate each other because they think we're wrong. Uh, we're just wrong on things. And so I'm thinking about the Methodists who are in the process, as we speak, of splitting. Uh, and they seem to be doing it by church. There are churches going here. There are churches that are going with the global group, which is more conservative. I don't know how the numbers will shake out in the end. Maybe somebody here does. Um, and I just looked it up. There are about 200 Christian denominations in the United States and thousands more internationally. And they've all split for some reason. The Methodists right now, the primary thing probably is twofold. It's their, uh, the LGBTQ issues, sexuality issues, as well as how one views the Bible. And they, those two issues relate very closely to each other. So why shouldn't we just split? I'm going to play the devil's advocate here because there are many ways in which it would be terribly sad if we did split. But would it be the worst thing in the world? Uh, and probably we would tend, like the Methodists, to split by churches. Um, although my local church would be really tough to figure out which way to go. Uh, so would that allow some sort of energization to go on, to feel part of a people who saw things similarly? Uh, would it be evil if we split? Uh, nobody talks about this. Uh, perhaps because Ellen White says the church will hold together through the end. Uh, so I'm just curious how, how you see that. Uh, why not just split instead of fussing with each other? There's no, no good outcome in controversy instead of harmony. Um, Ed, uh Thoughtful comments, uh, two or three responses. One is, I think that it would be um, reasonable and good for the church overall if we could come to a reasoned decision to recognize the sort of differences that you're pointing to and uh, and decide that a federated system of Adventism worldwide is a logical progressive step. Um, that is what the Church of England has done. So that you have the Episcopal Church in the United States, but you have dioceses of, of the Church of England that are conservative, like in Africa, and you have congregations of Episcopalians in the U.S. who say, hey, uh, my Episcopalian leadership and the church overall is accepting gays as priests. We're against this. So we as a congregation are identifying with the Church of England in North Africa. I mean, th that's what's happening. Uh, <clears throat> I do not think that Adventism is sufficiently mature for its leaders to get together and come to a reasoned uh, reformulation, a federated system like the Anglican priests and followers have been able to do. So what will happen? I believe that we will have a more ad hoc um, uh, a parting of ways in terms of important procedures. Look at the Pacific Union Conference. Uh, Ted Wilson was out here for a delegates meeting about, what was it, 10 years ago? 
<clears throat> and uh, spoke against women's ordination up front before the assembled delegates. Despite that, they voted uh, five to one, I think it was, or four to one to go and ordain women as a Pacific Union conference despite Ted Wilson's plea. Look at Pacific Union Conference's Oak and Acorn Press. Uh, look at what some of the things that Pacific Press is, uh, is publishing, which is a North American division entity. I think by, by, um, by a, a sort of tattered um, ad hoc approach, we're going to have uh, the sort of what you're calling split, but it's not going to be um, so much thought out at the highest levels as it is done for reasons of conscience, institution by institution, individual by individual. Does that make sense? It does. Um... I guess the the question is how much ease uneasiness persists in all that. Uh, I mean, it's uh, Ted Wilson, in my opinion, wasted eight years of his presidency trying to make good on his threat in both Calif in Pacific Union and Columbia Union that there will be consequences, and he doggedly pursued some meaningful consequences, nothing really came of it in the end is because he didn't have the power to do so. He just thought he did. And so if we continue in that kind of a uneasiness, that's not healthy. If we could come to some sort of cognition that this is where we are and we accept it, and sort of have an uneasy truth, so to speak, then that might work. Uh, trick is, how do we get there? Yeah, but, but, we need but to... Ed, Ed, Ed uh, wh wh why do we need to get there? I mean, look at what your floor, uh, Advent Help out of Orlando is doing for the good of humanity in the name of, of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, continuing the ministry of Jesus. They don't need Ted Wilson's blessing. Uh, look at what Loma Linda is doing <laughs> when it comes to openness to LGBT issues at Loma Linda University. Uh, La Sierra as a church, uh, La Sierra University Church, uh, openly affirming of gays. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't, it's of our own mentality that we have to wait for Ted Wilson. So, Jim. If everything's so copacetic, why are we having this meeting right this moment? <laughs> uh, and, because and we're, we're, to... you know, I, I'm I'm not saying they're copacetic. I'm I'm saying that uh, <laughs> that we we ought to have more self confidence in the name of um, of uh, starting with James White to do the conscientious thing. I, I see it a little differently. Uh, I see it that Loma Linda is kind of untouchable. I see it that Advent Health is kind of untouchable. They don't get a single dollar from the church. As a matter of fact, if there's any cash flow, it goes the other way. Uh, and um, they're pretty impervious to a whole lot of attack. Um, but we do so, we, we do these things, like you recited, in a context of dis-ease, where there's frustration, let me put it that way. Why do we need that in the body of Christ? Mm. Why do we I need to to sustain the frustration, the snide remarks, the criticism. If, if we could possibly get, <clears throat> pardon me, get to the point where we can say, okay, we have differences, we accept that. 
Uh, maybe we even celebrate it, to use your word. Um, but let's move on with more important things. It would introduce a note of calm and comfort into the church that I believe would be helpful. I'm going to go well, to Ed's service. That, that's true, him. but we're, we're human beings, and we've always been, will always be, when you have a denomination of 22 million people, given our history, given our emphasis on education, and our DNA, which is very affective, there's going to be um, controversy, um, difference of opinion. Um, <clears throat> I think we ought to just get over it and be about the Lord's business. Well, now you've discouraged me. You called me a human being. <laughs> Ed Zerkwitz, why don't you join us and let us know what you're thinking about this conversation? Yes, thank you. I appreciate the presentation, and uh, I want to follow up on this idea a bit about Adventist 2.0. Um, now, Marshall McLuhan in 1964, I, I'm going to look at this in a very different way, I think, made the statement, the message is the medium. And what he meant by that is that uh, the way information and knowledge is disseminated and who the targets are and so forth. I mean, it's a, it's a, quite an in-depth thing he came up with, but uh, and I want to apply that to the Adventist church. So who is sending out the information and and as to the, um, you know, the mindset of individual members, for example, where do they where do they get their mindsets from? You know, it's it's through information that they receive what they have been taught. You know, that are they taught the 28 fundamental beliefs before they can get membership? Uh, where do members come from? They they come from a good part. Part of them come from the school system. Uh you know, the uh, parents are eager to have their kids in school and then they're taught for whatever number of years and then they come out of there and many of them are baptized into the Adventist church. So that's one major source of new membership. So what it is, what is it that they're being taught in terms of Adventist uh, progressiveness or uh, fundamentalists, fundamentalism, I should say. And then uh, what about the publications? What about the the preachers, what about the conferences, you know, what kind of information, what kind of thinking, what kind of messaging is coming from all these individual sources? And of course, we've, you know, in this uh, channel, there's always Ted Wilson and the GC and what influence they really have. And, and I appreciate some of the comments because uh, Ted Wilson may not have as much influence as many people think. Uh, Although a lot of them bought into the sending out a billion copies of the uh, great controversy, perhaps. Um, and then there is the quote from Ellen White. Um, there'll be, uh, or the statement, you know, there'll be a shaking in the church. I haven't made up my mind what that really means yet, but. And then who is in control of the church? It's the Holy Spirit, right? It's God Himself, so to speak. So. So if we look at where is all this information coming from that's influencing members, uh, former members, uh, future members all across the world. You know, we have Adventist Radio. We have all these sources of information and and uh, and they all have a certain amount of influence on on the mindset of of individuals uh, around the world. And until, or if we really, so even the quarterly, you know, we know that's a very highly influential, there's a lot of influence from the GC or the, the people who work for the GC um, into that publication. And of course, it's it's used around the world. So the, that that is a major uh, factor too. You know, people follow that uh, quarterly study it and use it to uh, you know they don't challenge it very often i don't think or maybe some individual remarks 
And then we have publications like this one, or Spectrum, or, or the other thing going on where people are influenced in a different way. So, so getting back to Adventist 2.0, um, how will the mess? How is the messaging, if it does change, going to change, and in what direction will it go? I don't know if you can answer that question. <laughs> well, yeah, and 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 let me uh, first of all uh, comment on Adventism 2.0. Uh, I'm calling for, uh, and I encourage you to read the full piece in in Spectrum um, from which this presentation comes. But the um, the idea is that the sort of Adventism that is um, in the minds of almost all of us here is the 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 tradition, uh, and I'm calling that standard traditional Adventism 1.0 Adventism, and I'm saying that it's people like you who are in this discussion, who have the capacity the religious intellectual bandwidth to be able to move to 2.0 Adventism, which is the inclusive Adventism, the both and Adventism. You can appreciate the affective roots, the Millerite roots of Adventism, but you can also appreciate the emphasis on education and healthcare and reflective, the reflective sort of Adventism that can, uh, as we say, um, walk and chew gum at the same time. Whereas traditional Adventism, and I don't mean to be dismissive, but it, it's it's only got one key. You, you know, it's, uh, it, it's that affective key of Adventism and it can't can't countenance like James White could, the idea of believing in his wife as a prophetic figure, and at the same time not publishing her because he wanted to avoid the critic her her visions because he wanted to avoid the criticism of doctrines being based on her visions and not on the Bible. You, you know, it, everybody can't um, play all the strings on the violin; they have to pick out just one or two. Uh, so, so I'm saying that you people have the capacity, the bandwidth to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Most Adventists can't, uh, and they're stuck with 1.0 Adventism, and that's fine, because, as I say, God created ostriches and canaries. You know, you are blessed or cursed to be able to... Uh, to, to to do both and sort of stuff and uh but but you may not choose to or you may not be able to because you're stuck too in the uh binary of either or you know you either take the church a uh, lock stock and barrel or you're out of here um uh, i'm saying no you can appreciate the adventism cafeteria style you don't have to take it all you can agree with some of the 28 fundamentals, but you can disagree with others. You, you can be a conscientious individual and be Adventist. You, you don't have to take that either or approach that your uh, supreme leader in the general conference wants you to. The, uh, that's, I appreciate what you just said. Now, the the thing with uh, Adventist 1.0 is uh, you might be missing out on the richness of an, of inclusion. I think you mentioned that, someone mentioned that word inclusion before, of other people, uh, you know, the broad community in a sense. You know, if, if you're really focused on, you know, having the Adventist Aryan race, I'm being a little extreme in that comment, but um, Adventist 1.0 is more like, you know, we want the Adventist Aryan race. No, I, don't, I shouldn't say race, but I'm trying to make a point here. And then, you you know, the clean cuts, the, the proper Adventist, and then you get the broader community. And we, we don't want that. So we'd rather have the clean uh, Adventist group. 
<laughs> Sorry, I may I may have misstepped here a bit. <laughs> well, well, no, I no, I I, I get your point. I, I think that you're right. You know, yeah. I mean that that's Ted Wilson uh, is stuck on uh, he he's stuck on the old truths, and he doesn't want to move away from them. And as I was saying toward the end of my presentation, that is really a a um a failure to get the genius of the idea of present truth yes the sabbath was present truth to james white and so he started a journal that lasted for 18 months about um five years after the great disappointment because at that time the present truth was the coming of the lord and then it didn't happen and so Joseph um, Bates brought the Sabbath uh, message to Ellen and James White, and they accepted it. I, I believe this is good history. Uh, I, I'm, I wouldn't die for this. And then they saw that as present truth. And then that lasted for 18 months. And then they combined both the Sabbath truth and the advent truth and they had the advent the the sabbath what is it the advent review and sabbath herald so so you so that was the new publication that brought those two truths together and and, and i'm saying that's fine but but let's not fixate on what was present truth there yes let's continue to talk about the sabbath let's continue to look for the culmination of all things but we can we can we can uh walk and chew gum at the same time we can hold on to that and be open to hey now we know that uh the dna in some people is such that they are homosexual rather than bisexual uh let's be open to progress to further understandings uh, so so I, i'm just saying that um, it's you people who are uh, educated and open-minded and inclusive you are the sort who can be 2.0 adventist and that is understanding and inclusive of not only others like you on this um on this um on this zoom uh call you also can be understanding and accepting of fundamentalists who don't have the bandwidth you have and uh they uh <clears throat> they have a legitimate adventism just like you do although it's quite a different sort of adventism yeah i i think um you know like you're presenting as they're if if instead of bemoaning where we are you know through ted wilson and whatever if we if we can look ahead in a positive way and how things how through media i guess or messaging how things can change uh for the better and more quickly i mean nowadays uh, media isn't isn't that uh expensive you know like sending out a whole bunch of publications going door to door and all that stuff you know there there must be some ways to be innovative and creative and get this messaging out in a much broader way and jo maybe join join up with other like-minded uh, media type groups and and have a, a huge influence you know that i think that's quite possible to have a much greater well, influence yeah, yeah. Well, Ed, you may be pointing, uh, quoting McEwen, and the the medium is the message. I, I think. Uh, yeah. I think that's the way he put it. Uh, because uh, some missionary, Adventist missionary, said that he saw a person coming out from a village in Africa, talking on a cell phone. You, you, you know, the ideas now can be transmitted so much more effectively than was the case be, uh, heretofore. And look at the Adventist emphasis on education. There are 
I think I read that there's something like 2 million Adventist schools, if you count all of the elementary schools uh, worldwide. Uh, as, as Adventists become more educated worldwide, some of the information that we're sharing here in this country uh, through Oak and Acorn and Adventist Today and Spectrum, th that's yet to, to get to um, Brazil, for instance. Look at this book. This is George Knight's book, um, Ellen White's Afterlife. I understand from a Brazilian professor, she was born in Brazil, who's now at Loma Linda University School of Religion, that the hierarchy in Brazil saw that this book was being read widely. They bought up the rights to it and took it out of publication so it could no longer be circulated. But yeah. uh, there are ways around that. And, and given the increased educational level in Adventism worldwide, it may be that the sort of things that we're talking about here will, uh, in the not too distant future, be talked about more widely where the 95% of Adventists are in the, uh, in the developing world. So, uh, so rather than taking, um, you know, making decisions on, on numbers, getting back to my earlier <laughs> discussion with Lauren, uh, but let's get beyond evangelistic numbers and let's talk about integrity and doing that which is right and making discriminating judgments about our Adventist history and just being more sensitive, inclusive, in-depth uh, human beings. Uh, I think that we can come to positions which are more appropriate than taking simple either or sort of approaches to these things. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gina, are you there? Muted. Uh, well, I'll just go ahead and uh, jump in here while, while uh, I wait for Gina. Uh, the reason I want to jump in, I always come in about this time to let you know what's happening next week. And Jim, you'll be interested in this. Jim introduced me to a chap named uh, Warren Trenchard. Uh, Warren was an administrator and a teacher at uh, La Serre University. Interesting guy. And uh, Jim, I believe you had Warren give this presentation at your uh, Sabbath school class when, when he pitched it to me I thought I want this one too so we're going to next week be talking we, we you know you all know that we rarely talk about you know go deeply into the prophecies but Warren is going to dig into Revelation 14 6 through 12 three angels messages and he is going to show us how they were understood and sometimes misunderstood by the early pioneers and uh, how they were used. Now, I have a, I have a feeling, I, I could be wrong, but I have a feeling that if you gathered uh, 107th Avenues together and asked them what the three angels message mean, they would say oh, something about the time of the end, Jesus is coming again. But that would be about it at the most. And some people would say, I don't, I'm not really sure. I just know that they're the symbol that every time we look uh, up, up at our, even our stained glass window, there'll be three, three angels up there. Well, uh, Warren is going to talk, be talking to us about that. Uh, we had originally planned Brian Ness to be speaking, but Brian Ness, you'll find this interesting. I did at least. Uh, this week, his wife brought him some dessert I told him it was a dessert that was the problem. But as she walked over him, she built up some static in her shoes and she handed him the dessert and there was a, a little static spark that went from him to her and it completely burned out his computer. Quit, instantly was gone. And he has to start from scratch. So a little, just throw that in as a little warning. If you've got a lot of static electricity in your house, you might wanna be careful. 
uh, I did not realize it could completely destroy your computer. So he wrote me and said, Lauren, I just can't do it. I can't get ready for a, a class when I don't have a computer. It's going to take a, several weeks just to order my new computer and get it here. So Warren Trenchard stepped in, and Warren's going to be talking about Revelation uh, 6 through uh, Revelation 6 through uh, 14, 6 through 12. You'd think I would know my three angels' messages by now without having to stumble over it. So I wanted to let you know, I think it's going to be really interesting. Uh, Jim, do you remember uh, Warren giving you this presentation? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think you'll you'll enjoy it. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I've, I've always been intrigued how uh, we, we talk, we have this talk about loving revelation. If you really look at our eschatology, it draws on at most about one fourth of the book of Revelation and the rest of it is, is and, and Revelation 14, of course, is, is the heart of that. So anyway, uh, Jim, uh, I just want to said that I'm going to, I'm going to have a, a closing benediction. And uh, that doesn't mean we're quitting. We'll get to the rest of our hands here. But I'm going to have a closing benediction. I wanted to make sure that you knew who's coming up next week. Uh, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the challenge and the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the way that, that this topic has challenged us to try to be something more. I, I want to thank you for this community of Seventh-day Adventists that I have. I'm deeply grateful for it, but at the same time, Lord, give us the courage to move forward and be, a, a, if we need to be, a different kind, certainly a broader sort of Seventh-day Adventist. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lauren. We have five people with their hands up, and we have about 25 minutes left, so you should uh, understand and gear your comments accordingly. I had Chris Widmer up next. Go ahead, Chris. And then, Jerry, you're after that. Chris, Chris, are you Chris, there? Chris. I think I, I think I may have gotten rid of Chris. Uh, Chris, let me uh, ask you to unmute. To unmute again. I'm so sorry. That was my fault. There I am. Go ahead, Chris. I appreciate the presentation, Jim. Um, I am a La Sierra Loma Linda Adventist myself, having grown up in the Southland. But I found and noticed that when I moved north to Northern California to pastoral work, that not all people, not all Adventists were like the La Sierra Loma Linda Adventists. Um, my first church had a major church debate about whether people who wore wedding rings could be church officers, and it was divisive in the congregation. Uh, my original comment is simply that the the Western Adventist world is not monolithic, as no body is. Um, in the years since Union started voting to ordain women, regardless of GC policy, in North America, only two have done that, as far as I know, Columbia Union and Pacific Union. You haven't heard too much in some of the other unions. I might be out of date on that, but... It just seems that uh, that issue is still polarizing along with LGBT and things. I think what I heard you saying today, and I appreciate your optimism, and I needed a dose of that today, so thank you. Um, I think, you know, when you look at the time of Jesus, my wife has this theory that when the church is like the time of Jesus, uh, what when he came originally, um, like the time of Israel, then... Jesus will come the second time, which, you know, if you want to place any stock in that, uh, that's fine. The the early, the Jews had Pharisees, the, the law upholders, the Sadducees, who were the liberals, in my opinion. And then you had the Essenes who said, heck with it all, we're moving to the mountains. And then you had the Zealots who were trying to cast off Rome with their daggers and maybe some other divisions. There are all kinds of those same divisions within the church today. What I do see is when, when progressives have tried to do something wonderful in the world, the, 
the uh, extremists of the church, the fringe people, maybe, um, they have voiced uh, their opposition. And a good example of that is the One Project, which I and my wife attended several times, which you've certainly heard talk about here before. But the One Project, people lost their passion for it for a while. They they retreated to some level of safety. And they're just going to, they, I guess they're doing another one here right quick here in Orlando, uh, if not next weekend uh, or, you know, very soon. I don't know how to fix that. And I can't, I'm just a former pastor who's now a chaplain. So I'm a very small fish in the, in the big pond of Adventism anymore, though I was never that big. I was just a, a parish, a parish pastor trying to keep a congregation moving forward. I think Loma Linda Adventism is different than, you know, Bakersfield Adventism and it is different than middle Iowa Adventism and, and uh, South Florida Adventism. I don't know how you can keep everyone together when there is such divisive attitude on the part of some that you either believe everything we believe or you have to leave and just kind of leave it at that. I like, I like the bird analogy and thank you for bringing this to our, uh, our, our minds today. All right. I'm going to go to Jerry Connell and ask him to unmute Jerry. You've been very patient. Thank you. Oops, you just muted yourself again. Unmute. There All we right. go. That's it? Yeah, you're well, ready. We can hear you. Okay, well, I'll, I'll help Lauren out just a little bit uh, about our speaker next week, uh, Warren Trenchard. Um, he was my Greek professor back in the early 80s. <clears throat> and for those who don't know him, um, he's published Greek grammar books printed by Zondervan, and then several years ago uh, was contracted by Cambridge University Press to write Greek grammar books for them. So this is not someone who is unknown mm -hmm. in much broader circles, um, but he and I have remained friends over the years. He recently sent me a PDF of a bunch of papers he's uh, publishing. Um, but um, that, that's just an aside to encourage you to listen you know, next week. Uh, Jim, I appreciated your um, your uh, what you had to share. Uh, from a very practical level, and I'm, I'm a retired pastor, from a very practical level, uh, if you're at 2.0, which most of us are, but if the local churches are 1.0 uh, and they want to make sure anybody who comes in those doors uh, are know that they're 1.0s, uh, where would you take a someone you're wanting to do Bible studies with um, where they would hear the gospel? You know, and that's just a you know practical question. Um, I, but there's a couple of other things I wanted to wanted to just put out there. Um, one of my favorite authors is uh, N.T. Wright. You're probably familiar with him. And uh, in one of his books uh, I'm reading, he said uh, Luther's exegesis was very much a result of what was going on religiously and culturally in his world. And N.T. N.T. Wright, being a specialist in the early first century church and Roman and Greek culture, uh, tries to help us understand how to do exegesis based on what was going on in the world of Jesus and post-Jesus. Um, do you think that some of Adventist theology was just a byproduct of what was going on in the 1800s? And maybe we should examine that more closely. Uh, I thought it was interesting that William Johnson, a year before he died, in an interview said that the whole investigative judgment 1844 uh well to quote him it was a travesty uh teaching or tragic teaching uh you know the fact that he i mean his doctorates in hebrew in the book of hebrews william johnson's where if i remember right 
um, that for many years he held that position, but uh, it wasn't safe to put that out there in circulation. Um, and that for the two Adventist 2.0s, when we look at, you know, where we got some of our exegesis from, um, it raises some big questions. And then lastly, um, at the symposium in California a few months ago, uh, four months ago, where, you know, 23 scholars, historians showed up, um, some of them good friends of mine. Um, do you think the statement that came out of that was really representative of how most of the people felt? Or did some people carry undue weight because of they wanted to play nice and uh, are politically savvy in relationship to the denomination? I'm I'm going to ask you for a quick response, Jim, because we have several other people still waiting to be heard here today that have been patient. Go ahead. Uh, uh, okay, uh, Jerry, on, on that last, um, I saw that statement. I was there. It There was more said at that PUC meeting than what was reported, yes. but what was reported was not inaccurate. Um, and when it comes to... Um, to to uh, the culture of um, of Ellen and James White influencing them, uh, good insight. Yes, um, the culture, including Mormonism, influenced early Adventist thought much more than I think we now recognize. And thank God for the historians because we're going to know a lot more about it and and and, uh, and i think it will allow us to be more discriminating and less uh, carte blanche in accepting everything that was thought by those people in 18 the 1840s 1850s uh, et cetera et cetera oh uh, and let me finish just by saying something about evangelism to a 1.0 church, if you're a 2.0 pastor. Um, <clears throat> I uh, gave Bible studies to my 12-year-old granddaughter, and what I did, and she lives in North Carolina, what I did knowing that she, her, her setting is 1.0 Adventism, I wanted her to be able to distinguish the core of Adventism slash uh, Christianity from its uh, lived reality in Hendersonville, North Carolina. And so I made a clear distinction between what it means to, to follow the gospel, to accept the gospel, the Jesus-centered gospel, and it's uh, and the way that um, Adventists in Hendersonville, North Carolina, worship. I'm I, very I, I didn't familiar put, with. I didn't put down on the you know current worship in Hendersonville, North Carolina, but I made a distinction between that and core Christian belief. I'm very familiar with Hendersonville, North Carolina. Um, but my question then, again, from a very practical perspective, even if you can emphasize that to your granddaughter, uh, she's got to survive and grow in a 1.0 culture, which, from my perspective, is very difficult. All right. I see Beverly nodding her head, and I want yeah. you to weigh in on this. Beverly, go ahead. Hi, everyone, and uh, uh, thanks, Jim, for your uh, presentation. Actually, I think a lot of what I've been thinking and want to address kind of extends from what uh, I think it's Jerry, Jerry just mentioned. Um, I think we here, most of us, well, I guess we consider ourselves those uh, 2.0s, but, um, and we may have the luxury of saying, okay, we can pick and choose from the cafeteria 
of Adventism that you described about, you know, probably a good half hour or more ago. But um, my question kind of, you know, speaking up from what was just discussed, um, if you are coming into the Adventist church and being baptized, especially in conservative areas of Adventism, which is where I live and my, where my membership is in the Northeastern Conference in New York, um, uh, most of the churches there, when you are doing the baptismal vows, you are expected to believe all 28 fundamental beliefs. And you are expected to um, uh, believe in and agree with the quote unquote spirit of prophecy, which is referred to as Ellen White. And actually back in the fall of last year, I was in the Caribbean and the church that I attended the Sabbath that I was there happened to be a day of a baptism. And the same thing was, was done. And very specifically, uh, the minister or whoever was the person giving the baptismal vows to the persons to be baptized said, and do you believe in the writings of Ellen White? And so that very, 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 very 1.0. So again, the struggle is how do you become even a member if you don't adhere to all of these, um, uh, our, our, the, the tenets of our, of our belief? And part of me is, is not so... Um, Part of me struggles with um, someone you, you as an uh, you as a denomination organization want people to have um, a unity of belief, but you know the struggle is to ha having diversity of beliefs, but unity in terms of the broader beliefs of uh, God is love and He is the gift of our salvation. I mean, I know I've gone to kind of go off a bit of bit of a uh, tangent, but again, it's the struggle of you know, even coming into the church, you don't have the luxury to be a 2.0 if you cannot even <laughs> officially enter the body. So your thoughts? Well, well, like I was saying about my studying uh, with my granddaughter for her baptism, uh, and then I was mm -hmm. I did perform the baptism uh, for her. Um, and and that is to uh, to to uh, you know explain the the core of the gospel, uh, and distinguish that from the twenty eight fundamental beliefs. Uh, and, and it's not either or. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. more complex than that. Here's how, you know, when the twenty it was twenty seven at the time that they were adopted, the. The way that they were adopted in 1980 at that general conference session was that this represents the cons where most it, it was descriptive where most Seventh Day Adventists are now, and now and Ted has made it essentially a creed of 28. Um, but but if you go back to Adventist history, there were some who said we can't organize because when we organize will be like uh, those other churches that <laughs> kicked us out when we were wanting to follow the Spirit's guidance. Uh, and um, and so let's not organize. That's one reason the church didn't organize. And now we've become super organized. So th the, the answer is to, uh, to not let, uh, I've been, this is my theme all morning, isn't it? Uh, don't let others define your Adventism. Uh, understand their approach, but you don't have to accept their approach. You can be a good Adventist uh, on your own terms. That, that's 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 good Adventism. Lynn Boyd, go ahead. Yeah. Um. Uh. In uh, contrary to what some people think, um, as in education, where we have sometimes the achievement tests. We know what people are learning and where they are. We don't have that in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And Beverly, I will say, uh, you can comfort yourself that there is no standard worldwide when people are baptized about what they have to believe. Uh, I will illustrate that uh, because when I was in Africa as a, uh, as a country director at ADRA, I often went to quite primitive areas, but I lived in a pretty urban area. The contrast is very big. 
between the two situations. And in the uh, union where I was uh, serving, most of these pastors themselves uh, did not have the advantage of uh, uh, much more than a high school education, and that was the exception. Some of them were serving with a three, th three years of education, barely literate. And most of the congregations were not literate at all. You can imagine uh, Seventh-day Adventists who could not read the Bible. Um, that's kind of where you were in many cases. So <clears throat> they, I would, I would go into the, the places where we were doing our work and go to a church there, visit a church, and realize that these people called them Seventh-day Adventists, but they didn't know what they were talking about often. Uh, but they were there, and they supported the Seventh-day Adventist community that was there, and they felt like they were part of that community, and they were. Uh, does that make them a Seventh-day Adventist? I believe it did. I believe it does. Um, and uh, uh, the reason I'm, I'm actually bringing this up is that at the same time, uh, I, I recall, I've told this story in this group before a long time ago, but as Zerkowitz made me think of this, uh, the people at the top often don't know what's happening at the bottom in this organization. Um, they, they, they're wildly uninformed, in my opinion. For example, uh, it was at the uh, uh, union session. Uh, I was an ex-officio member. I didn't really do much in the church as an adverse country director, but I was required to be there. Um, and and at the time when this when the great controversy was being promoted, and everybody had to to get their constituents to read the great controversy or give it away. <clears throat> so the uh, division people came in from Johannesburg and told us uh, told the the presidents and secretaries of the of the uh, conferences there at the union session. Okay, you guys have to. Uh, meet this quota of, of great controversies. And all of them said with a straight face, yes, we will, yes, we will. When all of them knew exactly that 90%, 95% of their constituencies and probably 99% of the places they were, everybody was illiterate. They couldn't read those books in the first place. So and I, I'm sure they failed their quota, but anyway, uh, those people up in the GC probably have no clue. So my point is this, I'm, I'm agreeing with Jim Walters. Those people who thought they were Seventh-day Adventists, much different from me, I probably fit comfortably in a 2.0 category, but they are still my brothers. And they they are there because they believe what their pastor tells them. And, and they have no clue. Uh, and and, they're, and, they're, and they're, they're, their worship is in no way any worse than mine because they, they are in many ways their simple religion, their simple belief is much stronger than mine, and I learned from them. So I think I think we can we can all get along together, but we have to be um, careful and be tolerant, and and look at the core, not at the, all these peripheral issues. I'm done. I think that's very insightful, Dan Jet. You have the last word. You got you got two minutes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I had texted. Uh, Privately texted uh, our charming uh, moderator that she could cut me off if she needed to. Uh, we ran out of time, but I appreciate the chance. I'll make it very quick. Uh, it occurs to me, uh, does it change your idea about trying to reconcile the church or, or the different uh, points of view of the church? If you look at the motives of the General Conference, the Ted Wilsons, is it possible that they are not so wedded to their belief uh, in, the, uh, in the approach that they are uh, presenting, but looking rather at the uh, the viability uh, and the existence of the denomination going forward. Uh, do they care if they lose uh, the Canaries? Do they see that happening in other uh, denominations throughout this country and in Europe uh, and maybe growing with the more uh, rigid approach in uh, the less developed countries? And maybe that is a, um, factoring into their decision rather than doctrinal, the actual existence of the denomination. I don't know if you, Jim, if you have a, an opinion or maybe Lauren has an opinion, but I'm just curious as an outsider who doesn't really have a dog in the fight. I wasn't raised with uh, in an Adventist uh, uh, community. Uh, I can come and go with it. And the only activity I have now is with this 
seminar and the, the friends that I've made uh, through the years, but not with an active uh, congregation or the active church going forward. So thank you. I just need to tell you that uh, Jim left. Uh, oh, okay. his, he, he had a he had another appointment and he says, uh, I, I want to ride with my wife rather than going by myself. So he slipped out. But I will say this to you. Uh, I've, I've often wondered that, too. I, 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 I'm not sure that people like Elder Wilson really can make the distinction between what is a personal uh, a, a personal conviction and what is a conviction that supports the church. I, I think like some political people we know, it all goes together and it, it has to be all supported together. I think it would be wrong, however, to suppose that Ted Wilson is just being practical like uh, Jim asserted uh, A.G. Daniels was. The most dangerous development in Adventist theology in recent years is the way that Elder Wilson and others have pushed the concept of the shaking to the very top as a legitimate understanding. And every time that you hear Elder Wilson talk about the shaking, what he's basically saying is that I don't really care whether you leave or not, because God said you're going to leave if you don't agree with me. And so, no, I don't think that that he is sitting there and saying, well, you know, I really want Lauren Seibel to stay, but um, I've, I've got to say this, that we agree and that we, we stick strictly to these this set of doctrine because that's where most of my givers are, let's say. No. Uh, he, he has gone the full distance, and he is saying, I want, it is God's will that Lauren Seibold and those like him leave the church. And I have a theology for that. I have a quote from Ellen White, and it's time for that to happen. And that is, to me, Dan, the most dangerous development in the church in recent years. It's a very dangerous precedent. We could come to the point, uh, Dan, where, where we become... It, you know, Jim is in Loma Linda, and I'll tell you, I've been, I, I've spent several winters out in Loma Linda. It's a whole different world. It's just, it's not like where I am now. It's a whole different world of baptism. But here's something that you, you all might want to think about a little bit, and that is the possibility that we could become a business that started out of a church rather than a church with a business. If you think about Christian scientists, for example, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Christian Science Monitor. It was way more famous than Christian Science Church. It had way more readers than, Christian, than they had Christian scientists. And um, I, I fear that we could become an, a, a business that has a few Adventists hanging on the edge of it. 